Can we test that 54 basis points we we're just hearing from Taylor? Can we go even lower in terms of where the sovereign debt is trading in the U.S.? I don't see why not. I mean, the Fed is likely going to give some sort of forward guidance where they want to keep rates in check. It's not beneficial for rates to be rising in this sort of environment, particularly as we're mired in trying to navigate through a crisis. So there's only really one direction that they can go. The question is, is how much value do they offer? You look at treasuries, front-end treasuries yielding a measly, you know, 10, 15 basis points. You move out to the 10-year and you're yielding 58 basis points. There's not that much bang for your buck. So I think your investors are being forced to take risk other, other places. That includes the investment grade credit market where we've seen a huge appreciation in credit, in credit spreads and, and credit just in general, particularly because of the implicit Fed backing that the, the Fed has provided through their primary and secondary corporate credit facilities. So, Nick, I mean, with regards to the potential for going negative or at least getting down to that waterline, I'm talking on an official benchmark basis, uh, does the Fed even need to really do that at this stage with some of its, uh, I guess, the uh, levers that it has to pull with regards to QE, as well as just the general market response that seems to suggest we're pretty much already at negative rates, uh, at least on an effective basis? Does the Fed really need to make it official in any sort of form? You know, Romain, that's a very good point. You know, the question arises about yield, yield curve control. We're kind of already there. You look at the move index, which tracks bond volatility, and that's at an all-time low. You know, a three basis point move in treasuries today is considered a large move, considering what we've had over the past few weeks and the past couple months. Does the move to negative really achieve much? I don't think so. I think, fortunately, the Fed's in a much better position. The U.S. economy is in a much better position than, let's say, something like Europe or other areas of Japan that have had more negative yields for a significant amount of time, whereas they have the ability to increase the level of QE. They can do these unconventional monetary policy programs, again, introduce fiscal stimulus that ultimately hope to get to the bottom line and keep the economy or at least bridge the gap as the economy tries to power through this coronavirus crisis. Nick, I'm curious, at 50 basis points or so on the 10-year, what do you do? Is it all unrealistic because it's just the Fed pumping in liquidity? Or is this actually really attached to fundamentals because the economy isn't rebounding as quick as we think and it might be weaker than we all think? Sure. You know, look, I, it, it, the funny thing is, is that the Fed is really the only game in town at the moment. No one's really looking at the data. No one's necessarily talking about the election just yet. You know, we're all in an environment where... Not that many people are back in their offices. People are working from home. Uh, businesses are shuttering. Hey, there's, a, there's a significant problem that, that the world is facing, and yet the market's kind of just shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, the Fed's going to be there to backstop it. You know, the funny thing about yields in general is that bond investors typically don't buy bonds for the yield. They buy bonds for the capital appreciation. So if people believe that yields are going to appreciate, mm. you can make more money than the yield actually Dictates. You know, if you look at treasuries at 58 basis points, they rally to 50 basis points. You're looking at, you know, 80 basis points in return, questionably more, which is why people are looking to move out the curve to longer dated assets or moving into other asset classes like high grade credit, high, high yield assets where they can get a higher yield and potentially higher capital appreciation because the Fed is implicitly backstopping these assets. You can say the same thing for risk assets in terms of equities, right? We're sort of of the impression that you have an environment, at least over the rest of the year, where all asset classes continue to do well. They may not print the returns that we've seen over the last few months, but certainly you're going to see asset classes move higher, particularly because of that Fed backing. Where then, Nick, to gain the edge? If you continue to see, well, across the board, asset classes doing pretty well, not as well as they've done, where can you get ahead? Is it by dabbling in the high-yield area? And this is where the risk lies. You know, at the end of the day, we're bond investors, and we are hired to manage defensive portfolios that achieve a stable, consistent income level. It's very difficult at these, at these prices. We are used to be buying corporate bonds at a discount and getting that pulled to par, getting some coupon income, some capital appreciation, where now we're buying assets with a 105 handle, a 110 handle. That capital appreciation, the prospect for the capital appreciation really isn't there. We're having to look into other areas. Can we get carry from other countries like Canada, New Zealand, Australia? These are countries with positive yield curves that maybe have a little bit more juice in them 
um, to, to achieve some capital appreciation. We're very focused on the front end of the yield curves because we think globally the bar for central banks to be raising interest rates is extremely low. So if you can just capture that roll down over the course of the next year or so, right. you know, at least you can get some sort of returns. But don't count on big returns in the fixed income market. It's just not going to happen. Nick, I am curious about uh, the duration side of this thing. I mean, I, I can understand the play on the short end of the curve, but we've seen a lot of folks now starting to move a little bit further out in duration. I guess what are you seeing that makes you stay a little bit more pinned towards the short end versus moving further out to the long end? For us, it becomes what's the best information ratio on the trades that we're trying to achieve, right? So the front end, like I said, the bar for the Fed to be hiking interest rates is, is out of reach. It's completely out of reach. The likelihood of them hiking rates is virtually zero. If you look back to the crisis of 2008, the Fed was on hold for seven years. What we've been on hold, the, the Fed's now moved to zero three months ago, four months ago. Again, this is going to be a long drawn out situation. So capture that roll down in the belly of the curve because you're less focused on the risk. If, if yields were to move higher due to some inflationary pressures, assuming that would come about, again, focus on that front end. It, it becomes a lot more defensive. Again, you're not going to get the big returns, but you're going to get some return at least. Nick, from duration down to the credit scale, I'm curious if an investment grade corporate ag index at 130 basis points over treasuries or high yield at 500 basis points over treasuries, what provides you a better risk return valuation? Well, if you look at the Fed programs, our view would be that the credit provides, the high grade credit provides the best risk return optics. Why? Mm -hmm. The Fed's not in the business of losing money. And these primary and secondary corporate credit facilities, while they haven't been fully implemented, they're at least there. The Fed has $750 billion worth of purchasing power in the credit markets. And a lot of people say, well, that's not necessarily hitting Main Street. The Fed can influ influence markets. The question is, can they influence the economy? Because lent big corporations can issue bonds and actually get cheap funding, but smaller corporations aren't, aren't allowed to or can't, can't actually access that. So, again, there's the divide between what's happening in the market versus what's happening in the real economy. But if you look at specifically high yield versus high grade, our view is that high grade is, in, is significantly safer purely because of that Fed backstop. So as we focus in on the market rather, rather than the economy for tomorrow, Nick, what's the one thing you're going to look out for from the Fed? Just, just a general change in tone, which we don't think will happen. Um, the, the Fed has been, you know, very quite clear in their messaging over the last few months. You know, there's some indications that they could give some support and guidance on inflation, whether it's at the multi-year look back on inflation, which essentially moves the goalposts a little bit gives them some breathing room and allows them to potentially introduce more stimulus down the track. But again, we're not huge believers that the inflation train is moving ahead. We quite think it's the opposite and you're getting more deflationary pressures, particularly as you have more issuance. But you know, as, as long as Powell sort of sticks to the script um, and continues the fact that he's going to be there to back the markets, I think it should really be a non-event.